I'm Natalie Kenway, Global Head of ESG Insights at ESG Clarity, and welcome to the Green Dream video series. Today, I'm joined by Jamie Voss, Fund Manager of the Henderson Euro Trust. Thank you very much for joining me, Jamie. Good to be here. Thank you. So Europe has led the sustainability and finance charge. Can you highlight some key points for our readers uh, on why this has been the case? I think it's, re it's really hard to pinpoint why Europe has led the charge, and that would definitely be my perception. You know, I, I, when I think about governments, regulators, investors, companies, um, Europe does seem to be quite far ahead in terms of the thinking on sustainability. Um, why, though, is really hard to answer. Um, I kind of think almost in, in a way you need to look back quite far in history and you know, almost kind of post-war period in Europe, you saw the emergence of a number of kind of more left-leaning governments, some, some altruistic nature in a way, um, especially when maybe when compared to the US, for example. And then, and, and then also you have to think about the context of Europe as being a place where, in really simple terms, there's, there's not a lot of space, you know, when, again, when compared to the, the, a massive amount of space in something like the US. Um, availability of cheap natural conventional um, power sources is quite limited. And we've got a load of old, beautiful old cities that are, are not really made for cars to be, you know, driven around. And I think all, all of those things kind of feed into a social fabric that, that's always been just a little bit more focused on issues of sustainability. And that, that social pressure over time feeds to, you know, People vote. It leads to governments. It leads to regulatory action. And over time, Europe has become has become the leader, and that that's that's a, a very big positive for me as as an investor in European equities. Fantastic. And in terms of ESG, what are you keeping an eye on in terms of market developments in Europe? So, I, th I think you, you're right to separate this into market developments, maybe, and then to move on to kind of regulatory developments. So. On the market side of things, I think what will be really interesting is that something which a lot of you will have heard of has just come into action, which is the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regime, long name, uh, SFDR for short. And this is going to be very interesting to see how this develops from a market point of view, because this means that funds that sell into the EU will classify, will have to be classified as either Article 6, which is kind of agnostic towards sustainability issues, Article 8, which is known as kind of light green, which will be funds that really have an economic purpose as their sole, as their main reason for being, but they will also promote some social or some environmental characteristics. And then Article 9, dark green, you know, what we would think of as traditionally as, you know, as more sustainability focused funds. And it'll be really interesting to see how that develops over the next few years. You know, how will it develop? What percentage of funds will go into each category? How will different fund houses choose to choose to present their their, their kind of sustainability credentials and and intentions? Um, and also, how will it be monitored? How will adherence be monitored? And I think that you know, from a market point of view, is is something really worth really worth kind of keeping an eye on over the next few years. Fantastic. And yeah, you touched upon the um, regulatory developments, and it has been a very busy period. Um, is there anything else that you will keep an eye on, maybe the taxonomy or anything else related to that? Well, we've seen so much, right? I mean, in Europe, we've seen, first of all, everything seems to be based around the kind of European Green Deal. So we've had European Green Deal talking about, you know, the intention to get to net, um, sorry, zero net emissions by 2050. And then a few other bits of, you know, regulatory fabric built around that, you know, the sustainable finance strategy that we heard about earlier this year, which to me is, if I think of in really simple terms, it's an attempt to ensure that the financial system is supporting those European Green Deal aims. So how can we make, make sure that the financial system is, is directing private capital towards, you know, infrastructure needed for electrification or whatever it might be. And then, as you mentioned, we've had the EU taxonomy as well, which Again, being really straightforward about these quite complex regulatory documents, the EU taxonomy is all about disclosure. It's all about financial companies and non-financial companies disclosing more so that investors can look at them and say, you're a business model that's ad adhering to 
something that I that I like in the, the field of sustainability or you're not. Um, so all of those things, I'm kind of hopeful that there's not there's not huge amounts more regulation for us to, to, to deal with. And so hopefully the next few years will be about keeping track of those things. And certainly the sustainable finance strategy, we know that the commission will report on progress in 2023. So report on how the member states are, you know, are, are putting in place measures to ensure that the private financing of, of sustainability focused businesses is happening. So, you know, that, that's what I'll be focused on is, is, is hopefully no, not too much more regulation, but, uh, you know, how, how is the current crop of regulatory changes being embedded? Yes, it will definitely be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, moving on to the portfolio, can you highlight some of your holdings that have transitioned to a more sustainable business model? Yeah, sure. And it probably goes without saying, but this is a question I'm I'm far more comfortable addressing really than some of the some of the questions on on regulation um, and on you know on kind of market level things. Because as a fund manager, this is what I do. You know, I look at my stocks, I try and understand the companies I invest in as best as I can. So when we think about some of the companies in the portfolio that have moved to a more sustainable footing, there are there are many examples I could give. Um, I'll, I'll try and limit it to to a couple. Um, so the first would be a position we've owned for a long time, which is a Dutch business called DSM. Um, DSM, actually the name itself is suggestive of this, but when the company was founded 100 years ago or so, um, it was actually a mining company, Dutch state mines. It was a, a kind of English version of, of, of that, that phrase. So um, it was a mining company, and then over time it transitioned to a company that was quite focused on materials and, and resins and plastics. And over the last 15 years or so, um, under very capable and managers that I really, really respect, a so very capable stewardship, the business has moved towards food ingredients and in particular, very focused on sustainability of food production, um, which is something that is, is a hugely important topic um, and one that is, you know, our understanding needs to improve um, over time. Um, and they're a company at the forefront of innovation in that field. So they've moved from being a mining company, digging stuff out of the ground and selling it, to being a chemicals company, you know, and plastics and not very, not things we would associate with sustainability to a food ingredient and focus business. And that transition has been a multi-decade phenomenon and, and, and one that's been very welcome from an, an investor's point of view. So that'd be one I'd mention. Another one, which is a, a more recent addition to the portfolio um, that we bought at IPO a few years ago, is SIG Combly Block. This is a Swiss business that make aseptic packaging. So think of it as, you know, in, in, in France, it's the packaging that you would get your milk in in a supermarket. You know, in, in the UK, we might get soup in aseptic packaging um, and maybe oat milk and things like that. But essentially, aseptic packaging is a fantastic material to replace the use of plastic, essentially, in a, in a lot of food and, and, and drink and markets. And so that the very existence of that business and its large peer, Tetra Pak, the very existence of those businesses really um, helps to, to ensure more sustainable supply chains in, in food and beverages. And, and the other side of things, there's a social element as well, you know, because in a lot of uh, developing markets. There's not very well-established refrigerated supply chain, something we take completely for granted in, in the, here in the UK or in the US or in, in Europe. Um, and in the absence of refrigerated supply chains, aseptic packaging is a, a really essential thing to get to get very basic food products from one place to another um, whilst maintaining you know, the, the, the quality of the, the product itself and how long that, can, that product can last for without refrigeration. So those are two examples, and I say I could I could name a, a number more, and you know I am quite focused on finding businesses that are either performing very strongly on on metrics related to sustainability, or businesses that are making substantial improvements. So it's a interesting question to answer. Thank you. Fantastic, and I would like to throw in one more question on the fund, if that's okay. Um, can you talk about? Um, the ESG criteria that you look for, and are there any exclusions that any any sectors or companies that you just won't touch? Yeah, so there's there's several things that we do. Um, the first thing I'd say is that 
sustainability and the analysis of sustainability has always been a, a, a big feature of our analysis. So, you know, this, this far predates actually even my time running, um, running Eurotrust. Um, we've always been focused on quality companies and the two almost go hand in hand. So whenever we analyze a company, we are always thinking about sustainability. And then in terms of exclusions, it's something that, you know, over time, I suppose, we've, we, we've, we've moved more towards thinking about exclusions. And, you know, I mean, I own, you know, no oil companies, I don't own any mining companies. So there's, there's an element of, you know, my, my investment approach naturally excludes a number of companies that wouldn't score particularly well on sustainability features. But it's something that we want to go further in that direction and make it clearer to investors that, you know, we will not invest in in these certain activities. Um, and so that is something that, you know, over the next six months, you'll see more from us on that on that subject. And the other thing to think about with an investment trust is that is that I have a board that I report to. You know, I have a board that provides oversight and provides challenge. So something that we've put in place in the last 12 months in, in a formal way, and that will continue, is that when I invest in any business that, that scores poorly um, on uh, ESG metrics, according to some of the big external rating agencies, I will have to explain my position to the board. I'll have to explain why I'm invested in that business, why I see that, that company improving in terms of its sustainability score and it, it, its, its focus and approach. And the board have the right to tell me to sell something. You know, if they if they do not see that as a, a suitable investment, they can tell me not to own it. So there's a number of things. And, you know, especially as regulation, um, some of the things that we discussed earlier, SFDR especially, you know, as regulation changes over the next 12 months, you'll see more from us on this subject and you'll see us talk more about it. Um, so I, I, I look, very much look forward to updating the market and investors on that. Fantastic. Thank you. And a question we always finish the green dream on is what is your favourite sustainable drink or snack? OK, um, I was mulling this over. <laughs> it's a tricky one. Um, and there are a number of things that sprung to mind. Um, I was thinking Blackberries because my kids got three kids and they kind of forced me to pick them almost every day as soon as they're out. But I, I, what I'm going to go for is um, a maker of um, kind of organic and plant-based natural ingredient snack bars called Tribe. So I'm a big fan of these. Um, they taste great. You know that it's being manufactured in a, in a sustainable way with the, with the right kind of mindset and controls and balances in place. And even beyond all of that, it's a company that is very altruistic in nature and, and, and donates um, a significant portion. It's quite a small company. It's kind of a startup. But you know, they they focus on at the moment their charitable giving is focused on modern slavery, and they've they've donated you know almost a million pounds now towards um, towards kind of trying to trying to get rid of mod modern slavery. So, you know, I can see an environmental reason for for eating their snacks. I can see a, a kind of more social responsibility reason, and they taste really good. So that that kind of works for me. Fantastic. That's definitely one we haven't had before, so thank you. And thank you for sharing all of your insights with us. It's been great talking to you. Anytime. Thank you very much.